channel, so only say things that you want publicized on the internet. Um, <laughs> Gary, you want to run with the list of the pre-meeting? Yeah, first, um, there's only one topic really that was brought up by the administration side, um, and that was EMS charts documentation uh, with regard to trying to build correctly. I just come back to the basics. Um, there's been some discrepancies between um, actual names and names that we have on charts, date of birth, recent addresses. So sometimes if a person has moved recently and uh, if that hasn't been updated on the insurance side or hospital side and we import that from the HL7, we're going to incorrectly build that address. So just to kind of be aware of keeping those details correct and true. Um, and going along with that, um, having down in the uh, demographic page, meds received but not listed, or past medical history received but not listed, make a little bit more of an effort to try to complete those fields if you can, uh, because again, that ties into um, trying to build a, a certain transport correctly. So, um, there's been an over-reliance on the HL7 feed, and some hospitals are better at updating that than others. Um, mainly Allegheny is poor with updating that, and the past the other facilities are better, do a better job. Um, and that is especially so with uh, traffic accidents and auto insurance. So um, it would be helpful if you get the name of the insurance company from the auto um, insurance, if you can do that. Uh, on accidents, and um, there is a uh, sometimes a reliance to say normal baseline without being specific as to what normal is. So, if you're going to say normal baseline, just include what is their normal baseline. Kind of all, that all right, that's all very good information. The one thing I would throw at you is. Pre HL7, uh, we, we struggled with patient information um, for a variety of different reasons. One that comes to mind for me was manor care. We used to think always had uh, this information recorded. Um, pardon me. She's calling in. Or meeting. <laughs> it's just not there. Can, uh, can you try and help Turkovich out, please? He needs the right um, password. You should be in your, your input. Um, so th the message simply is this. If you fill out the, uh, the signature form on the back and get the patient information, that is very helpful to Deb and Sue. Um, we do have a lot of nice technology, but sometimes technology can bite us in the butt and we don't always get the information that we think we're going to get. So while it's driven at making our lives easier and getting us more accurate information, sometimes it doesn't work quite the way we want it to. So please take time to fill out the uh, patient information on the back of the signature form. And um, you know, I, I think we're going to get to a point eventually where we're even considering taking photos of the patient's driver's license and insurance card if we have time and access to that information. But we're still working through the details of that, the legality of that, and all those types of things. But um, that information is very important. And uh, the insurance company's job is to minimize their loss. So they're going to find every way they can to not give us money. So the more information we put in that chart, the better off we all are to get that done right the first time. So good conversation. And that was it? That was it. Wow. I guess that's a good thing, right? Yep. All right. Um, does everybody have an agenda? Thank you. Um, so you, so you all know Adam is in class. If you see him on his phone, he's not uh, being ignorant. He's trying to do two things at once. So I appreciate your efforts. We need to step out. I certainly understand. Um, number one, reporting to work on time. We're still doing uh, everybody reports to the 211. Uh, gets dressed here. Does um, uniform cleansing here to the extent that we can. And then leaves that dirty stuff here so you're going home clean and healthy and coming here clean and healthy. Uh, one problem that's arisen from that is uh, arrival for work and departure from work. The expectation is that at 7 o'clock or 8 o'clock or whatever your shift start time is, you're ready to take a call. It's not coming in my shorts and flip-flops, get punched in, and then be ready at 8.30 or 9 o'clock. So 
The same is true on the outside of the shift. You shouldn't be changing clothes at 10.30 or 10.45 and anticipating your 11 o'clock departure. You should be ready to take a call until the time you punch out and then you can change it at home. Um, I, I think that's just a, a friendly reminder. I think it's uh, pretty clear that that's the intent of the organization to be operationally ready to take calls at all times. So, um, and the other side is you guys want to be courteous to one another. So being here a couple minutes early, coming in the morning, the overnight guys certainly appreciate that. And um, you know, on the 11 o'clock departure, sometimes the 24 hour people have the opportunity to repay that by getting you out of here on time. So I think uh, the, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Well, it's very true in shift change times. From a, a peer to peer perspective, but certainly from an organizational perspective, we want to be ready to answer calls quickly and efficiently all the time. So, um, there will be a memo coming out on chart completion. There's been a little bit of confusion recently on what needs the chart. Clearly, if you treat a patient, get a refusal, transport a patient, that requires documentation. Uh, what has been uh, questioned recently is when we are disregarded, um, if we start to respond and divert to another call, those types of things. So I'm going to try and clear that up in a memo just so we're all singing from the same sheet of music. Essentially, if you get disregarded by another Ross Westview unit, that Ross Westview unit is probably going to be the one to author the chart. You then don't have to write a second chart. But if you divert to a higher priority call and that original call is now going to mutual aid like the Canlis or Shaler, we still have to write a chart for that because we have to document the time flow of how that 911 call process. So when they call and say, it took you guys 30 minutes to get here, I have some way to look back and say, this is the reason that happened this is what caused that to occur or that didn't occur these are what these are the real times this is what actually happened so we certainly don't want to make uh, busy work for you guys we're not writing charts for fire alarms if you cancel before you leave the station or things like that I, you know I don't think anybody has an expectation that you're gonna write a chart for that but if we initiate a response we need to write a chart so any questions on that uh, we already covered documentation items. Um, Debra Sue, anything you want to add to the documentation part of that? Gary took our information very seriously this morning, and I thank you. Good. And I think you did a pretty good job of articulating that back to all of us. I think you hit the points pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, Gary! <laughs> And uh, that concludes our meeting. <laughs> um, information processing. Uh, since March, we've been uh, inundated with information uh, related to COVID, related to grants, related to equipment, um, road closures, hospitals, decontamination. And I get that we have information overload. We tried to be. Um, as adaptive to times as we could be. We put out video memos, paper memos, emails, voicemails, tried to do a variety of different things to keep the interest up and the digestion of that information up. Uh, please, please, please stay vigilant on that. There's still a lot of good information coming out and it's important that you guys are getting that and receiving that. Um, if you take a 10 minute video and let it play in the background and you don't hear any of the information that defeats the purpose of the video, uh, we're paying attention to how many hits it gets. We know how many times the video has been viewed, but I really have no way of knowing if you're taking that information in when you're watching it. Similarly, on an email, you know, um, I have no sense of feedback that you have gotten that email, read it, and understand what we're trying to get across to you. So it's very important that you guys are, are getting the information that we're pushing out and uh, understand um, things for your safety, operational things for the organization, administrative things, and, and while I get that there's a lot of information sometimes, uh, it's, it's important that you process that to the best of your ability. Um, we're back to having a whole bunch of students again. Jen, you want to hit on the CEM, CCAC students? Yeah, so we have, currently have two summer students. They're from the off-site program, so none of them are in the EM program yet. I'm not sure exactly if we're going to be getting those students or not. Things are a little bit disorganized at the center. Both Nikki and Sarah are off on maternity leave. They have one person filling in. That person's never done their job before. Communication with that person's been sporadic. Uh, they don't have their uniforms. All of their time was scheduled, and then I was informed they don't have their uniforms. They're not permitted to come without the uniforms. I gave them Ross Westview uniforms and told them to take the patches off, asked the center if they could do that. The 
Senator didn't get back to me. I finally got in touch with Tom Platt. He said, we got in touch with the guy, said that that was fine. So they may be starting this week, not sure. Um, and there's one CCAC paramedic student and a couple CCAC AEMT students. Uh, and volunteers is next on the list. And there are a couple of volunteers that will probably be coming back soon. And some others that have interest that I'm working on getting them in here, getting them trained with proper policies, PPE guidelines, and things like that. So we're going to be seeing more people around the station that we need to tend to. Anybody have any questions? Jeff. Can you do me a favor? Can you wake up Steve? He's up. Is he here? Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's up. Mm -hmm. All right. Disregard. He did a good job, thank you. <laughs> you were about to be sacrificed. You're going to go to the right center. On the volunteers, similar to students, CCAC paramedic and EMT students, ride-alongs, all that type of stuff, we, we suspended the volunteer program back in March with COVID. Um, as we learn more about um, COVID as a virus and what it means to us and uh, the PPE we have, we're starting to re-engage more of those programs. And uh, I have kind of a unique perspective on the volunteer side of things. I think we're missing an opportunity right now to embrace people that don't have a whole lot of other things to do with their free time. And uh, at my fire department, I've seen an uptick in volunteer applications because of that, which is a good problem. So we're gonna try and re-engage our volunteer program so some of you may have been engaged by Jen or Ryan. Um, asking questions about other organizations you participate in, be it fire departments, be it other EMS agencies. So we're just trying to see uh, if we can find a way to embrace people in the community that have a skill set to help us um, get more stuff done, put more trucks on the road, be more proficient at rescue. Um, so we're really looking at uh, some out of the box ways to try and tackle that and get some more volunteers in here. We certainly have some uh, very good volunteers. Liz is a great example. Uh, and we have some that are on the roster that don't do a whole lot. And there are other organizations that have a robust volunteer program and have done well over the years. So uh, we want to try and figure out a way to uh, maximize that and embrace those folks as best we can. So. One thing I think that is very important that we just started scratching the surface on, but that is something you can all help us with, is how we engage those folks when they're here. Um, just like each of us, we want to learn something new every day at EMS. We want to be um, challenged to be our best. And I think uh, folks that are coming in here, be it students or volunteers, have that same desire and expectation. So you guys are subject matter experts in what you do. Share that knowledge with them when they're here. Um, OK, maybe not. Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> I don't want to set the bar too. Yeah. Um, so be welcoming, be encouraging, uh, force training, force equipment knowledge, force station knowledge, service area knowledge. Um, and you know, some of you that comes naturally too. We can watch and see who does that and just grabs those folks. And then others, it takes a little bit of reminding to say, hey, you know what, we got some new folks here today. We got to get downstairs and do this or do that. So. Just be, a, be ahead of the curve on that, embrace that opportunity, because it really makes each of us better at our jobs, and we have the opportunity to be teachers. So we think through the things we want to say to people that we're teaching. We want to sound educated and not uh, give a bad example. So um, it really does a good job for all of us as an organization. So any thoughts or comments on that? I think you'll see that unfolding over the next couple of months. Jeff, go ahead first. So um, what if those people that aren't interested in the medical aspect of it don't want to get that Uh, we've not had that conversation. I, I think historically we've uh, talked about everybody on the rescue being an EMT at minimum, and if we wanted to have rescue volunteers, they at least had to have the ability to uh, complete a crew for a fourth out truck, drive a truck if they have critical patient, and in order to put two providers in the back. Um, I don't know that we want to reconsider that, but that's certainly something we can talk about. So, good question. Andrew? Uh, we talked about it pretty significantly yesterday. I had a lot of good ideas, good conversations, things like that. One of the concerns that we had, myself included, was you build up this volunteer base, then all of a sudden my job goes away. I, I don't think you have any concern of that. Uh, in fact, I would share with you, um, in summary of my career here, I was initially hired to supplement volunteer staff. And uh, 
it was competitive to get a shift then, and I'm sure Brian and DJ and Jen can tell you how that looked on the schedule in the 90s. Uh, we, we would come in on a Friday night for our paid shift, and there wouldn't be a spot on an ambulance for us. We'd either be stuck at the station or riding the rescue truck, or, uh, but never once was I sent home as a paid staff person because there were too many volunteers dating back to 1995. And um, it, the, the fact of the matter is there's just not the numbers to do that for the number of shifts that we have. So I see this purely as a supplemental to what you guys are already doing. Um, there's a lot of ideas, and, and this came up in the supervisors meeting from Bill about could we add extra staff to free the supervisors up more to do administrative stuff, get us more time on the rescue truck, get us more time on the squad so we're getting different experiences. And we would like to be able to do that, but that all comes with a cost. And in a, even an event like this, if we look around the room, multiply each of you times two hours for a meeting at an overtime rate, there's a big price tag to that. So we can't just throw shifts out on the schedule because we have this good idea. But if I get a volunteer to come in that's getting a nominal volunteer reimbursement, and then I can say, Andrew, you're on the rescue truck today, or you're riding on the squad today, you have a completely different experience at work that day, and that's good for you, and it's good for us as an organization. So I, I think that that is a very honest question, and I appreciate you guys having that dialogue. Um, but I would assure you, you have no worry about losing uh, time or shifts. Um, in fact, despite our best efforts, when we put on a big hire and overstaff by one FTE and have more part-timers than we need, we still find ourselves struggling to fill shifts. So I, I don't think having 10 or 15 <coughs> volunteers that are putting in um, 20, 20 hours or 24 hours a month, if we're lucky, is going to change that at all. But a very good question. Any other thoughts? Liz? I have never, Andrew, in all the shifts that ever come in here, uh, in seven years, I have nobody's ever left here when I was here. Nobody, they've never been like, wow, we have a free person here, so we're going to send you out of here. No, not one time has everybody, anybody left here in all the shifts that ever worked. And today's really a good example that we have extra staff today because of Liz. It wasn't necessarily like getting sent home, per se. It was like part-timer here versus volunteer on like shifts or not shifts like well, I'm sorry on like uh, EPRO and then all of a sudden well Andrew costs money Liz does not that's kind of what we were kind of mutually agreeing on was kind of concerning yesterday yeah I, um, I I don't foresee that being an issue I appreciate the thought and I, um, I don't know how, how I can easily dispel that concern other than just show you over time no, I think you answered that very well I appreciate it <clears throat> I can tell you, my 30 years, it's never happened. So, uh, I, I think it's, it's certainly easy. certainly a good <laughs> point. <laughs> but uh, I, I think the area that you could potentially see something like that occur is in the shift pickup area. That's, right. we're talking That's what we're about, talking about. You know what I mean? Where a volunteer goes in and picks up the available shift that's there, and you don't look at it again. Yes, yeah. the schedule is full, but right. at the same token, he's well, been he's been very lenient uh, in accepting that if someone is interested in the ship, just not the last week, I don't recall who it was. Uh, and, and we brought someone in when we were at staff. So just because you know the person was available, part timer that had an interest in coming in. And in, and in the case of part-timers particularly, and I think I told Jordan and Serena and Norm when, when they all started, if you aren't seeing shifts on there that you guys can pick up, it's important to me and the organization that you have those exposures, right? We want you to see our equipment, our people, how we do business. So you can't go months without working here just because we don't have available shifts. So we'll put you in there upstaffing just to make that happen. And I know that makes Brian's neck hair stand up when I say that, but the occasions where that's occurring is infrequent, but it's very valuable. So, but it, it, that's a very specific and good question. I like that, um, but I, I will find a way to not let that happen. It's not to say that if a volunteer is the only one that bids on that shift, I'm going to leave the shift vacant, waiting no, for someone no, to pick it up on overtime. But you know, if multiple people are bidding on it and one of them is a volunteer, I'll just be up on that on that particular shift. Let's just try to get to that point. Where yeah, right. I'd love to have that competition. <laughs> if we have that problem, <laughs> you know, we could, we could uh, actually improve the so. fishing. Um, hazard pay, uh, you guys have all seen the increase in your pay 
starting um, sometime in August through sometime in October. It's five consecutive days. Uh, I just wanted to draw all your attention to that because that started out with uh, very specific guidelines from the state of Pennsylvania that received some money from the Federal CARES Act to do a hazard pay incentive for essential workers. Uh, we applied for that grant and implemented that grant fully intending on um, exceeding what money we were going to get in, uh, far exceeding what money we were going to get in. More than half of what uh, was going to be spent was Ross Westview money and about 20000 or so of those dollars was coming from the Federal CARES Act. Uh, us, along with every other fire and EMS agency in Pennsylvania, were, was denied for that grant, uh, so we did not get that money. And thanks to Brian and the board, uh, we're still spending in excess of $50,000 just to make sure everybody gets that hazard pay. Um, unfortunately, it didn't work out the way we intended. We wanted to do a, a one-time lump sum incentive. Uh, that program was implemented and started based off the, the Pennsylvania regulations, and then we didn't get the funding that we were trying to comply with thinking we were going to get and the program had already initiated. So long story short, all that money is coming from Ross Westview's general front fund at um, Brian and the board's work. So um, I just thought it was worth you guys understanding the backstory behind that because uh, certainly the administration is very appreciative of how dynamic our job has been over the last uh, now six months and uh, we certainly appreciate your efforts. And, the, the headaches that you've had and the amount of training we've had to do and the risks that we're all taking. Uh, so um, I just thought, thought you needed to know that history and I, I personally want to thank Brian because I certainly appreciate it. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Greg, you guys. along those same lines, I know you have brought this up, I think, in one of your video messages and I was sitting right beside Liz and you had said you were going to think of some things that you could do for our volunteers and it probably only applies to a couple people. But <coughs> did you guys figure anything out yet? We have not. We've talked about a couple different ideas. But <coughs> I know it's tricky. We're still tricky. working on that. Uh, and some of that is driven by we have to be careful um, what levels of reimbursement we do and how we do that because of tax implications. But we're still thinking through that. <coughs> I, I'm good. Yeah. Hey, Jen's worried about you. Got no complaints. <laughs> Uh, MDRA, MDRO, and SBR training. Steve and I have been working on the logistics of pulling this together. We've had a pretty good uh, level of interest. Uh, because of COVID, this is a Ross Westview only class. We're trying to keep the numbers low. CCAC is aware of that and on board with what we're doing. Um, so unfortunately, we're not going to have uh, students or people from outside agencies, fire departments, other EMS agencies, where we typically would open that up. In this case, we want to make sure that we're doing that as safely as possible. And the other side of that is it's important for you guys to get um, some time on our tools, on our rescue truck, and get to understand how all those things work. And frankly, you're not going to have a pull up on a rescue scene here with 24 people to help you. So you might as well get the hang of doing it shorthanded now because that's how it's going to be. Um, training tomorrow and Wednesday's monitor training, the staff meeting, all those being paid events, um, the BVR series and the special vehicle rescue series. We've not um, scheduled a regular September training in lieu of all of those events with the desire of spreading you guys out over a couple week period. Uh, we also don't want to take time away from you so you can come in on any one day for eight hours in addition to the staff meeting, the furniture training, and the Zool training during the rescue week and train at a paid rate to get time on the tools and make that your, your quarterly training. That is not mandatory. Um, folks that are working through school schedules, and I've talked to a number of you, uh, I'll do whatever I can to get you that information, get you through that class, but it's very important that we get you caught up on that uh, rescue training side. Questions about that? should be fun. I hope to see you all there. Um, I know everybody's got a lot of stuff going on, so it's not mandatory, but uh, you should embrace the opportunity. And certainly the, the newer folks are doing this for you guys, so take advantage of it. Have fun.
Uh, Zoll monitor training, we initially intended on doing that today, tomorrow, Wednesday. Uh, the lady who's flying in is flying in from Florida. She's the Zoll clinical um, trainer or subject matter expert. I'm not sure what her official title is. Her name's Carol. She's flying in this afternoon. Unfortunately, she couldn't get air travel yesterday, so we couldn't do today's monitor training. It will be three sessions tomorrow, 8.30, 10.30, and 12.30. You need to attend one of those, not all three of those. So I don't care what time you come, but please let Jen know so she can coordinate that. We can try and spread people out a little bit. And then the last one will be Wednesday morning at 8.30. Uh, so we'll have four sessions to pick from. Um, if you cannot make any one of those four sessions, that's fine. We'll get you caught up on the video and some hands-on time on the monitor. But after Wednesday, you will not be able to work a clinical shift on the truck until you go through that training with the new device. That's obviously a very important device in front of a patient that's a VTAC or VFib is the time to figure out how it works. So um, we're going to go through that today, tomorrow, and Wednesday, and we hope to have this in service on Wednesday. Uh, Sunday, we put the new mounts in the trucks, so the sole mounts are in the trucks now, but the Philips MRX monitors are still in there. So when you take the monitor out of the inside-outside cabinet, you have to fasten it onto the, the bench seat with the seat belt until Wednesday when the new monitors go in because the old monitors don't match up with the new monitor mounts. That was a mouthful. Go ahead, Steve. Uh, the monitor mounts are not in 7, 8, and 3 is not back yet. Okay. I saw your email. Um, I'm hoping to have an answer for that today so we can address that Thursday at the latest. Okay. But, thank you. Just to bring the rest of you up to speed on that conversation, we were debating on the best location to mount them. Some of the trucks were pretty clear on where they had to go. Some of the trucks, we wanted to put them where they were most advantageous for you clinically to have access to the monitor. The problem that uh, we run into with two of those trucks is if we put them where we want them, then you have to cross the cables to get to the radio on the other side by the suction unit. So um, we're trying to figure out if we can move the radios to the what would be the officer side, side door entry area, to make that a little bit better so everything's in one spot. And that, I don't think that should be a big deal. I think we can just get an extension cable for the radio and change the faceplate, but I don't want to speak for the radio guys because I don't know what's involved with running those wires and those things. But, so that, I actually emailed them this morning, so I'll let you know as soon as I hear back soon. Uh, Furnace stretcher. Uh, that's a little less critical than the monitor, so there's only one training session for that. We're going to do that. Today, immediately following the um, staff meeting, Phil from Furnace is actually downstairs unpacking those right now, and uh, he'll be ready for us at 11 o'clock when we go downstairs. If you can't stay for that, I know some folks said that they had uh, some other commitments or class or whatever, that's fine. Um, if you do stay, you're welcome to stay on the clock and pay for it. We're going to look to you to help us share that information with the folks that miss it, and certainly we have the video that we'll get everybody to watch. Um, I think pushing the button on the stretcher up and down and putting it in and out of the truck is a little less critical than the Zoll um, training. But uh, it is still important nonetheless because it changes how we do business a little bit. That stretcher is uh, weighted similar to the um, striker power cot we have. It's actually a couple pounds heavier. The reason it's a couple pounds heavier is because of the accessories that are on it. Uh, so I, I didn't want to get into this on the text the other day, but one of the reasons we decided against the monitor mount on the stretcher was because of the weight and that tray goes across the feet of the patient, which in some cases may be limiting to how we put the patient on the stretcher. Uh, so I just, I'm not opposed to that, I just want to make sure we think through all of the um, operational and clinical implications of that before we do that. So, and if you've had experience with that, I'm certainly interested in hearing it. Um, but one of the things that they offered, we decided against early on was exactly that, because we could take that monitor and clip it right into the same mount on the stretcher as we have in the trucks, but it just it adds weight and you have to make sure their legs are straight underneath that tray. So, um, but we'll take a look at it. So weight changes a little bit. So how we take that stretcher in and out of houses is probably going to change a little bit. Uh, I think we'll, we'll uh, memorialize that in some type of policy on what houses you could and couldn't take that in and out of based on <coughs> steps and space and surface and those types of things. But the point that I want to drive home is. The new power stretcher isn't an excuse to walk more patients because we can't get the stretcher in the house doesn't mean that patients should be walking from the house to the stretcher. If you have somebody that needs to be seated or laying down, then that's what we need to do to move those patients safely. We 
We shouldn't be standing up, chest pain patients, lots of breath patients, stroke patients. Um, you know, we're here to take good care of our patients. We want to make sure we're doing that. So um, while that stretcher is an important piece of equipment and designed to help you do your jobs better and keep you healthier and protect your backs for lifting, it's not um, a reason to get out of taking care of that patient on the front end. And I, and I worry about that because I don't want to get in the habit of walking with folks that should be clinically cared for better. Uh, any dialogue on that? Any thoughts on that? Uh, some of you guys have more experience with those devices than I do, so if you can help me figure out a way to operationalize that, um, I'd appreciate that. But um, I really want to make sure that we're taking advantage of the benefits the stretcher provides us, but also still taking very good care of our patients. Make sense? Um, Steve found a uh, glitch in the narcotics tracking system. If you guys draw up um, any medication that's a Schedule II medication, but particularly Versed and, and Diazepam for seizure patients, where we're thinking, he's already seized, he's post-dictal, he might seize again, I'm going to draw it up so I have it ready. Solid clinical decision, we want you to keep doing that, we don't care about wasting the medication, but when you click wasted in the action app, um, the activity log under add action, that wasted action doesn't force a special report like medication, fentanyl medication, Versed medication, ketamine does. So on four occasions we had Versed that was drawn up and wasted, correctly documented in the chart, but then we didn't get a special report which what drives the replacement of that medication from Allegheny General. So it's very important that we get that done. We're working with EMS charts to make sure that that wasted function forces a special report going forward, but that may take a little bit of time. So in the meantime, if you waste a medication and have not administered a narcotic, it's important that you remember to write a special report and click on the radio button that says narcotic used. Go through your example you gave at the supervisor's meeting again, please. Yeah, the wasted button. Um, whenever you're adding that to your activity log, just be cautious because if you utilized, it's got to be two separate entries. If you utilized part of the drug and wasted part of the drug, you can't enter those in the same line, if you will, unless it's free text. Right. So if you go in and say that you use you know, 50 of fentanyl out of 100 and you wasted 50 and you click that button, it's only going to show it as wasted. It'll show every bit of that as wasted. So just use a little bit of caution with that. I've seen that uh, documented that way. As well, can we come up with a standard on how we should be documenting that under narcotic use? I think we talked about this before, but nothing really went out. Uh, so uh, I, think we, I think we did actually when we transitioned from passive into AGH, we put that out. I'll have to dig back through it. Because then we talked about the medication, the date, amount given, amount wasted, lot number. Yes. Yeah, some of the special reports are just coming through with whatever drug they use. But um, all per se, with nothing else documented along with it. Some folks are documenting what, what they used, what the lot number was, what they wasted. Um, I think that's kind of, in my opinion, that's probably the better way to put a little bit more information. So, uh, for Steve to come back in. Steve, did you have anything you want to add to that? The narcotics? Yeah. No. Could we cover that sufficiently for your concerns? Yep. If you don't know, Steve is the guy that um, processes all of the requests through AGH to get expiring medications particularly Schedule II medications replaced and track them. And if you realize the volume of medications that travels in and out of that little safe, it's pretty freaking impressive. Um, so I give them a ton of credit because tracking that back to each PRID, making sure it's replaced, making sure we get expired stuff replaced is not an easy task. So um, your vigilance is helpful. Uh, QA and charting. Um, for the most part, charting completion has been going pretty good. We've had a couple speed bumps over the summer, so I'm just asking to stay on top of uh, getting 
getting that done as accurately and timely as you can. And the QA at the S1 level is a little bit backed up, so over your next few shifts, you can spend just a few minutes helping us get that caught up. We would appreciate that. And then at the S2 level, we have the same issue on the crew chiefs and supervisor side, so we're, we're working through that. It's not terribly abnormal to have that happen in vacation season to get backed up on some stuff like that. But we're back into September now, so we're re-engaging all of our planning, training, um, operational execution, etc. So. Uh, just a friendly reminder, QA is intended for all of us to be better at what we do. It's not a punitive process. It's not a um, pissing match between you and whoever the author is or you and whoever the, the clinical provider is. It's, it's really intended to make us all better at what we do and document better. So please find it as welcome and take advantage of that opportunity. Uh, we purchased on a um, restricted fund grant three binder lifts. Uh, we did the training on those binder lifts, but we never really um, figured out how we wanted to deploy them operationally. So uh, there's one sitting in the living room, for example. There's one sitting on the freezer downstairs. I'm not sure where the third one is, but we want to make sure that you guys are taking advantage of the opportunity to use those. They don't do us any good sitting around the station. Um, and if you like them, we're going to add a couple more because um, they're not terribly expensive and we're not big fans of just having a couple of something we like to have one in every truck uh, but we want to really get them out and get them used so what we want to start doing and we can do it today is put one of those binder lifts on each of the three trucks one at 212 and two out of 211 so that you guys have them and can use them if you need them uh, we've thought about putting one on the rescue truck and one on the suburban but that would mean you would have to get there for a lift assist call for that specific piece of device and that's probably a little more frequent than needing the man sack or a uh, stokes basket or a piece of rope or something like that. So, so we want to get them out, get them used, and if the feedback is good, they're only a couple hundred dollars to add them. We'll, we'll put them on each and every truck. It's just a matter of um, getting the feedback to make that happen. So um, starting today, we'll put them out. You guys can play with them, use them, let, let us know what you think, and hopefully we can either shake hand because they don't like them or add some more. That's right. Um, my service at home deployed them, and obviously I'm not there quite often, but when I was home over the summer, um, we used them on the witnesses, and it was awesome. They just give you so much more to grab onto. Um, it's a lot more secure. Instead of like, oh, there's someone's on. Yeah. They're super cool. Cool. And I think that's pretty consistent feedback from what we've had from the folks that they try them out. I just, we're just not taking advantage of them right now. They're sitting around the station. Um, ultrasound, on that same grant, we received money to purchase our first ultrasound. Um, It'll be a butterfly ultrasound device. We've had an opportunity to play with a couple different devices. Uh, why we picked the butterfly is one, it's reasonably priced. Two, it's easy to navigate. Uh, three, it can plug into just about any um, iPhone, iPad, tablet, Android product. Um, so Steve's working on finding a, uh, an iPad specifically for the butterfly. Um, I don't have the, the software on it. it We'll hook up the Wi-Fi in any one of the trucks and push that data out as it needs to. And then certainly you guys can uh, plug that into your phones as well if you want to download the app you can and, and play with it. Um, what we've used it for so far just in training is venous access and cardiac standstill. And uh, it's very easy to use in those two settings. It works very well for helping us find veins on patients that are difficult sticks. And the more we use that, the more things we'll add to that. We can look at things like lung slide for pneumothorax, um, blood in the belly, a um, bunch of other stuff, so OB kind of stuff, so it's just not something we want to throw out and um, not make sure we're using it in a manner that's educational and safe and beneficial for the patient, so we're going to start off kind of easy with it and then uh, push on more items as we add them, but should, um, in addition to providing us some clinical benefit on destination and, and what we terminate on scene, for cardiac arrest, it should also help us all understand our anatomy and physiology a little bit better because in order to deploy the device, you kind of have to know what you're looking for and where those things are in the human body. So, uh, but pretty cool. And right. if you have an opportunity to use Tyler Adams as an IV dummy, he is absolutely hysterical when you're putting him in the needles. I would encourage you all try it at least once. How many of those we found again? Just one to start. There's the on 217.5. The device is about $1,500. There's a service we have to pay annually for uh, web access, and then Steve has to buy a, um, a tablet.
tablet specific for that device, so all told we'll probably get into it for about two grand. And um, you know, if, if we knock it out of the park and everybody loves it, I'll find a way to find some more money to get more of them. But I think initially one should be, should be sufficient for the amount of times we're going to use it. Do you have any idea of when the training I would guess our November training days, that'll probably be a topic, but between now and then we'll do shift training on it as it comes in. Um, you guys all saw the parking lot. Mark Egan did a really nice job with that. Uh, Ryan Mann and Colin Bashline came up with the idea of extending the parking lot lines out of the garage into the parking lot and adding uh, garage door numbers. So we've done that on bays one through nine and a half. We have to add the zero on bay 10. So that, that all looks very good. And we still have to seal the seam from the new asphalt to the concrete where all the garage doors come down. We have to do that before the first freeze-thaw cycle so that uh, water doesn't get in there and crack anything. So we'll be working on that. And then the upper parking lot is going to get um, relined and uh, cleaned up and repainted. So that will be happening soon. So that, that's pretty exciting to see. We needed that for some time. There's uh, been a handful of QRS concerns, uh, some from fire departments that don't really provide QRS that end up on scenes, helping out some from fire departments that we worked with for a long time. And, and I would just ask that we all keep in perspective what the intent of QRS is. It's stop bleeding, give oxygen to people that are having a hard time breathing, do CPR, and defibrillate people that need early energy, right? It's so, so our, our really high priority, easier of calls. Everything else is fluff. If they cover somebody with a blanket and make them feel good and keep them entertained until we get there, that's awesome. If they give us a good report, that's awesome. If they tell us to bring in a monitor when we're gonna take it in anyway, that's awesome. But at the end of the day, they're there to augment what we're gonna provide. If they don't show up on a call, you guys are still gonna go do all the things that you would do anyway, right? So don't allow them to influence your decisions on equipment you're taking out of the ambulance and bringing into the house or the, or the um, apartment. If they tell you you don't need your bag, they don't know what you have in your bag, so they can't tell you you don't need your bag. If they tell you you don't need your monitor, you still need to take your monitor because that's a, that's a policy of the organization. We can't defibrillate somebody with a monitor that's not with the patient, right? And, and weird things happen. Patients arrest in, in inopportune times, and the only way that you can fix that is to have the equipment to fix that. So. The point is this, be embracing to the help that they're giving us, try and have positive relations, and take advantage of that opportunity. Um, certainly, if there is an issue, write a special report, I'll follow up with them. Uh, I've talked to Chief Snyder from Perrysville recently, it was uh, Friday of last week. I talked to Guido and now Donnie Kumpel from Berkeley pretty frequently <coughs> on a variety of issues from Knox Box Keys and access to buildings and traffic on McKnight Road. Um, but the point is we have open dialogue with them. They certainly uh, share goods and bads with us, and we can do the same with them. Um, but it's important that we embrace that relationship as a positive experience. So, thoughts or concerns on that? Greg, I have a question. It's not a concern, um, but hearing you talk made me think of this. With the, I haven't looked at the pouches on the Zool. Will the extra equipment that we currently have in our monitors fit in the pouches on the Zool? Uh, I think that's probably a conversation we want to have through the course of the day tomorrow. But I would tell you that my experience, um, and I, I think this is kind of a COVID conversation we have to have too, is my experience is that folks aren't really doing that initial assessment, keeping the bag away from the patient the way we had set out to do that. And I think we're having trouble with stethoscopes getting broken, thermometers getting lost and broken. And I think we really want to take a look at whether or not we need to continue to do that. Um, but the answer is yes, there is space in there. While we're on that, do you guys have an opinion on that? Do you think it's beneficial to keep the stethoscope and thermometer in the monitor, or do you think it's good to move it back to the house bag? Nicholas? I have it in the monitor. Just, I like to have the thermometer in there, the stethoscope and the thermometer. Just like fly out, or you know, they get tangled with the uh, defibrillator cord in there, and the defibrillator cord is always like. body repairs and so now the important part is stop wrecking shit. Um, 
get to the video mic stop record yet? I did. <laughs> it's, an official, it's an official statement from the administration. That's the first thing um, when it started back up. <laughs> I say that was kind of a fork tongue because I was the first one to bang up the V217.5, so I'll get that out of the way because I'm sure somebody's going to say it. Um, but uh, the fleet is in pretty good shape right now. With that, 214X, which is the spare truck, is loaded with rehab supplies. To convert that back to an ambulance is just a matter of unloading that stuff, putting the stretcher bracket back in it. But what we found with the seventh vehicle, the last time we did that with the old 214.9, is we used that almost zero times, with a very few exceptions. And so that vehicle just sat and wasted away in the garage, and we didn't find that to be very beneficial. So uh, at the same time, we're wrestling with what do we do with all this new rehab equipment that we just got on a grant. And we came up with the idea of putting that stuff in that truck. So if we have a, an incident where we need to get rehab stuff deployed quickly, that truck is very well equipped to do that. Uh, if you haven't seen the new rehab tent, uh, it is really, really cool. Um, it's an inflatable tent. It has its own ventilation system with heating and air conditioning. The air conditioner was provided by EMS West through some work of uh, Steve and I. And um, it, it can chill that thing down to uh, frosty 20 degrees below the ambient temperature, which is pretty impressive. So um, hopefully the occasions where we're using that is infrequent, but it's certainly a very nice benefit to have. There are only a few of those around the county. Closest to us is Robinson EMS up um, Route 28 corridor. Tarantum Fire Department has one in the AK Valley out in Westmoreland. I think Murray's Woman One has one. Uh, EMS West has some. And then uh, in the south, I'm not really sure, but it's an infrequently available item for, uh, for use, so um, it's kind of cool that we have one, and we'll certainly use that in conjunction with our rehab plan as we need to. Um, the rescue spec kind of hit a stall over the COVID crisis. So just uh, this week, Steve and I talked about trying to reinvigorate that, so you'll see some information coming out on uh, getting a meeting back there on the continued progress of specking the new rescue truck. Uh, Ron and uh, Adam and Nick, three of you, uh, went to the uh, slow down move over rally in Harrisburg last week. Um, that's been near and dear to our hearts uh, forever, but certainly since December when we had a truck struck by a tractor trailer and totaled on uh, 79, 27. I think it got hit on 79 and it landed on 279, but I'm not sure exactly what we call that piece of road there. Uh, but got a lot more attention as to just how dangerous some of the things we're doing are and, and uh, how concerning it is for us working out on the highway. So uh, to drive out to Harrisburg and back in a day for, for a, a political rally is a testament to our commitment to how important that is. So thank, thanks to Adam and Nick and Ron for taking the time to do that. That's a, that's a big, long day with two big, long drives just to be present at something like that. But I would tell you that it was noticed by uh, EMS officials around the state and political officials. And, it was of value, so, um, and what you all should take from that is, uh, you know, be safe on the highways, we're, we're committed to your safety, but we still gotta make safe decisions and make sure we're doing everything as best as we can, because things can change very quickly. Um, capital fund, fund Drive is going out this week, Brian? Uh, end of the month. End of the month, and uh, that is uh, essentially just a mailer asking for donations. That goes to uh, all the businesses and all the residents and the five communities we serve. Uh, it's important that we continue to highlight the good things we're doing on social media because that's how folks know um, the value of EMS and the North Bills to them and, and should encourage them to donate. Uh, if you would happen to encounter anybody that has any questions about that, that money is used specifically for equipment purchasing. So uh, you can tell them we just purchased 300000 and some change in monitors and stretchers and two new trucks this year and new Suburban and, you know, just to let people know where their money is going. And I think uh, you, you won't see very many questions about that, but just in case you do, that, that mailer's going out. Uh, it's important that we speak well on behalf of the organization. Uh, injury update, Charles should be coming back hopefully the uh, end of September, early October. He um, had surgery on his arm, he tore a bicep muscle, so uh, happy to hear that he's coming back. Uh, Richie unfortunately separated his shoulder and um, is following up this Thursday with ortho after having had an MRI. I think he's going to be out for a period of time despite uh, his desire to come back and work. 
Are they sending him to manor care for rehab? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he's going to let that happen. No. <laughs> uh, <what? laughs> I tell you, he's a pretty entertaining patient. He's, he's, uh, he's funny. I, I'm uh, pleased to tell you that of his two ambulance rides, I got to be present for both of them. And uh, both of them were equally entertaining. I was only there for the Bell's Palsy one. Yeah, that was number that, one. That was entertaining, too. And uh, Josh, happy to see your smiling face. We're, we're getting Josh back on the schedule here in a couple weeks. So that's exciting news. So. Uh, last thing I have is the 2021 budget. Uh, it's hard to believe 2020 has gone by as quickly as it has. We've certainly hit a shit ton of speed bumps, um, but uh, we're starting the plan now for 2021. And uh, how we do that compared to what we have historically done is a little bit different because we need to think about things like virtual training and um, remote access to meeting platforms and things we really had not needed to plan for from a financial perspective before. So if you guys have any creative ideas or things that you would like to see next year, uh, now would be a good time to let us know that. Um, I'll get the, the wish list updated and back up and you guys can put all the stuff that you desire to have on there and we'll, we'll do our very best to, to get what reasonable requests we can. Brian, anything you want to add? Uh, no. Tricia? Nope, I think everybody's been doing a great job. Anything from you guys? I think we've been doing a great job too. Specifically. <laughs> <laughs> Norm, would you reach over and pat him on the back? <laughs> uh, last thing I'll throw at you is uh, uh, Ron and I were on a conference call on Saturday morning with the USAR team, uh, which was a pretty neat event. I think it went okay from a training perspective. Uh, but one of the things that came up uh, during that was uh, Mark Pinchock gave an update on uh, COVID and uh, pandemic planning committee, which is a thing, uh, anticipates that this week and next week we're going to see a significant spike in numbers because of schools going back, colleges going back, uh, social gathering restrictions being released a little bit. Um, so I just ask that you be vigilant with your, your PPD. Continue to try and be uh, understanding and relaxed as we can, but if we're out of the building, masks, if you're engaging a patient, N95 or better, glasses, gloves, all that kind of stuff. So um, we've done very good at keeping everybody healthy here. Our um, call offs since March have been um, essentially non existent, which is excellent because that's way better than it typically is. Um, Nobody here has tested positive. We've only had a couple of people that needed to be tested. Um, and even that is scary enough. So um, I'd ask that you maintain that vigilance because it really keeps all of us safe. And um, as we come into the fall resurgence of the flu season, that, that will help us um, all stay healthy and get through this. The other thing he said that struck me, uh, which thought was very important as he thought we we're just a couple months out from a vaccine and that uh, it was a good chance we may be tapped to help do mass uh, inoculations in the community so I'd keep an eye out for some training for that but that's like fresh off the press information I don't know what that means beyond that statement so, go ahead Rachel uh, you mentioned flu when are the flu shots for us coming in uh, we talked about that briefly last week but I don't know that we have that answer yet I'll get that out to you today. Okay, thank you. During that conference call, did Mark have any insight on the potential for blanket testing for free hospital providers to see <coughs> if any of us are carriers that were never symptomatic? No. no. They, okay. are, they are providing uh, testing now for public safety. Um, about this, but um, the way they're conducting that testing right now is a city training on Mondays and Wednesdays. And what we have found is I could potentially send someone to Wet Express and get a quicker turnaround time. In some cases, um, you know, my concern with only doing it on Mondays and Wednesdays is don't get exposed on Thursday because you can't get tested until Monday. Potentially, I could have results back in two days um, 
for you know, an exposure. So uh, the, the last case that we had here um, had the individuals actually test at both locations uh, to see which one had a quicker turnaround. And they, they really kind of fell into that 48 hour period post uh, testing. So there wasn't much of a difference, but that tells me if it's happens on the wrong day, we're, we're waiting for four days to even get the person tested. So, But so I, I think Jason was asking about non -symptomatic antibody testing. testing. Antibody testing, no, nothing. And, and that's, what, that's what I was just going to say next, because antibody testing, there's been nothing that's come out. I think antibody testing has been, you know, you have to pay for it on your own as well to even get it done. And there's been reports that it's not very reliable anyway. I think if you don't the regular COVID test, right, so. yeah, I think if you donate blood, they'll do an antibody test that. for you yeah. for free. But other than that, I don't know of any other free way to do it. Right. So we, we actually had quite a lengthy conversation about this. We struggle with the value of it because I think it gives us a false sense of security, um, particularly with the idea that the, the virus could mutate and change and there's no guarantee that if you have a positive antibody test that you're not going to get the virus again. So I don't really know what value it has for us as public safety responders that are going to encounter multiple sick patients. We can't really lighten up our PPE. We can't really can't say, you know, Nick, you had the, the virus, you have the antibody, so you're good to go, just do what you want to do. So what's, what, do we, what do we gain by doing it? Nothing Other really. we know we had it. It's just know? a curiosity thing, I guess. Yeah, right. I did get one. Um, my service was offered for free. This was our social health system. And the only thing you provided was just, like, more information. Because right now we don't know anything. So it's interesting, like, well, I've had this number of COVID patients. Like, did I happen to catch it? And mine was not um, so I didn't give did they have it. anybody positive? Um, I they didn't release results for people. Um, I just got my um, knew it was negative. But at least from that perspective of I knew like my exposure wasn't enough to develop an antibody. Um, so if that gives you any information, but it just gave me more information than I had before. I took it. Good. Anything else? Adam? I think just to clarify a little bit that uh, with Rachel's question about the flu shots, I don't know about the center program, but CCAC's allied health program has given us a specific deadline that we have to have those flu vaccinations done by. And I think it's more question of whether or not we need to seek out maybe doing that giant egg or push it way to get it done here. Uh, so I believe if you do it through your insurance, through our insurance, there is no, Patty, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's no copay or you get reimbursed for the copay or something like that. But Ron and I will investigate that today and get you guys, I'll email out an answer today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Motion to adjourn. All right.